Welcome to the Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Michael Wong. I am the founder and executive director of the Physician Patient Alliance for Health and Safety. This clinical education podcast is made possible by an unrestricted grant from Medtronic. Today, we're talking about the need for clinicians to recognize the signs of respiratory compromise. So I'm very pleased to have as our guest, Jennifer Lightdale. Dr. Lightdale is Division Chief, Pediatric Gastroenterology and Chief Quality Officer at the Children's Medical Center at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Could you please give me a brief background about yourself, Dr. Lightdale? Sure. Thanks, Thank you for asking me uh, to do this podcast. I am indeed a pediatric gastroenterologist, which sometimes I refer to myself as a plumber. <laughs> and in pediatric uh, GI, we, we do see a whole range of, of issues in kids, really from newborn up through college. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those conditions do mandate that we do endoscopy. So uh, as part of endoscopy, I've, I've really become very interested in sedation and um, how we take care of patients as we actually get them through the procedures. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in terms of how you and I have intersected, I think when we think about respiratory compromise, that is the number one risk we deal with when we sedate somebody for a procedure such as endoscopy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, procedures are can be very risky. Patients and families think that they are um, risk-free, and in reality, they may not be. So that's why you and I spend quite a bit of time uh, talking about or thinking about respiratory uh, compromise. Uh, last year, we spoke with Dr. Jeffrey Bender about respiratory compromise. Dr. Bender is chairman of anesthesiology at North Shore University Health System, and he's also chairman of the Clinical Advisor Committee to the Respiratory Compromise Institute. In that interview, although sepsis and respiratory compromise are clearly very different conditions, Dr. Vender believes, similar to the sepsis awareness campaign, that greater awareness about respiratory compromise will lead to earlier diagnosis and interventions, which may drastically improve patient outcomes. Uh, what, do, what do you think of Dr. Vender's um, opinion, Dr. Lightdale? Yes, yeah, so obviously I think respiratory compromise is indeed one of uh, the, the harbingers uh, that uh, the patient is quick to physiologically decompensating. And actually a very similar model is occurring in sedation. Obviously with sedation, it is a man-made situation where we're administering uh, sedatives with the goal of putting the patient to sleep, so to speak. Uh, but the big risk is you could uh, induce a level of consciousness where the patient now has respiratory compromise. And I think recognizing that respiratory compromise or the risk of respiratory compromise or as the respiratory compromise is beginning, the earlier you can recognize that that's happening, uh, the more likely you are to reduce adverse events and certainly uh, bad adverse events like patient death. So Dr. Vendor's concepts definitely hold up with what I do. So I hear from a lot of families, uh, unfortunately patient families who have experienced death or serious adverse events like uh, brain injury uh, following a, a procedure, and that's how uh, I've gotten involved with families. Um, but th there seems yeah. to be a lag between early adopters of new technology and broad acceptance uh, and use. What do you think can be done to overcome reluctance to use capnography and, uh, in general, sort of continuous patient monitoring? So I think we're at a point for most patients undergoing sedation that there is continuous monitoring going on, but the monitoring is really of oxygenation using pulse oximetry. Capnography, of course, is a technology that allows us to measure ventilation, to really measure uh, gas being exchanged, CO2 being blown off. Um, and uh, I think there has been some reluctance to uh, add capnography to a monitoring routine of using pulse oximetry um, and observation. So uh, why do I think that is? It's certainly the concept of you're going to add something new in, people have to learn something new. That, I think, has definitely been a barrier. And then uh, I think, unfortunately, another big barrier has been cost. As you bring in a new monitor, there, there are now additional hardware costs and, and even um, per patient costs. So, so there's certainly some cost uh, issues which have contributed.
you're absolutely right. There's obviously technology and the cost of technology, and then there's learning time or making sure that folks are kept up to date with uh, uh, the technology, how to use it, uh, how to interpret the, the waveforms and that kind of thing. So it's both a technological problem and both a, a human problem. So let's talk about the um, um, meta-analysis that you did. In, uh, wh why did you do that study and what did you find? So we recently published a study uh, that I did with a health economist, uh, Roger Saunders is the first author on the study, um, where we looked at all studies, all randomized controlled trials in particular that had been done comparing monitoring that involved capnography with monitoring that doesn't use capnography yet. Uh, and we looked to pool all the data from all the randomized controlled trials that we could find because each study in and of itself was able to show some effect of capnography, but not the big one that everybody's looking for. So what's the big one that everybody wants to know? Everybody, meaning people who are really setting standards and key opinion leaders who can make uh, real changes in practice, want to know whether capnography indeed, if added to routine patient monitoring for uh, procedural sedation, would actually reduce patient deaths. That unfortunate and rare situation where a patient dies, could that actually be uh, avoided if you use capnography? Luckily, patients don't often die during uh, procedural sedation, so it's actually quite a rare occurrence, and it's so rare that it's quite difficult to do a big enough study to actually capture the, that effect happening. So you would need a lot of patients in the study in order to answer that question. And we calculated it, and it was more than 26,000 patients that would be needed uh, in the study. Actually, I think it's in each arm of the study. So it's an enormous randomized control trial you'd have to do if you really wanted to prove that capnography prevents patient deaths. But there is a, a, a technique you can use where you pool the data across lots of studies and try to see if that now gives you enough study power to, to answer your question. Uh, and and we did find some answers. It still doesn't quite show us that it avoids patient death. It still wasn't big enough in terms of what we found. But we do see very consistently that capnography detects respiratory compromise and avoids both uh, significant and less severe uh, oxygen desaturation. So it certainly is useful for avoiding desaturation, whether it's minor or major. As you mentioned, having enough power to the study could possibly mean that you'd have two groups of uh, patients and run into the, uh, the moral dilemma of uh, monitoring some but not monitoring others and allowing the others to uh, perhaps suffer an adverse event or even death because they weren't monitored. So that could create uh, that sort of moral conundrum. That, that certainly that. could be one. The other thing that's fascinating about sedation research is you cannot and you should not uh, tell the providers not to intervene if they're worried for the patient. So inevitably, mm -hmm. if a patient is experiencing uh, respiratory compromise and now is going on to become more unstable from a cardiorespiratory standpoint, uh, appropriately, clinicians now intervene. So they literally rescue the patient before the outcome of interest mm -hmm. occurs, which is totally appropriate. We want them to do that. It really is quite hard to find that outcome of interest. In fact, you don't want to find it, as you just pointed out. So, um. I guess maybe the goal really should be, have you been able to reduce the severity of the adverse events that have occurred? I often hear from... Um, hospital executives that say, oh, I don't have a problem with respiratory compromise and insufficiency and in death. Uh, uh, an event this has never occurred on my watch. Right. Then I sort of ask them, you know, uh, so how much Narcan do you guys use at your facility? And then they'll, they'll obviously know that answer, and that, that seems to indicate some kind of issue may be occurring at their facility in terms of uh, making sure that the patients are safe uh, while opioids are being administered. Right. That's exactly correct. And actually, uh, the correlate in our study was we looked at how often bag mask ventilation needed to be used. So it wasn't the administration of Narcan, but we were looking to see whether there was ventilatory assistance using um, a, a, mm -hmm. a bag mask uh, approach, and we found that use of capnography was associated with significantly decreased use of bag mass ventilation. So you, you aren't needing to rescue the patients as, as often 
because you're picking up that respiratory compromise sooner and you're intervening much sooner probably by just either titrating your medication or um, asking the patient to take a deep breath <laughs> at a critical moment. So, Yeah, and, and yet yeah, when I think about the adoption of pulse oximetry, there hasn't been a study that's shown that pulse oximetry would reduce patient deaths. And so then is it just a matter of time before capnography is is more broadly used and adopted? I think so. I think it is um, always an issue of supply and demand in terms of dictating the cost. Mm -hmm. Again, one of the big barriers. And I think the more mm -hmm. that capnography is simply built into a monitor and it's very easy to use it, it'll be something people more use. Frankly, as, as you have new generations of physicians coming along and they're, they have become educated in it and expect to use it are looking uh, for measures of ventilation rather than just measures of oxygenation. I think you'll, you'll have some change. But um, it is interesting that people still are reluctant to realize how lucky they are every time they, they uh, perform a procedure and it goes very smoothly mm -hmm. or they rescue the right. patient uh, at, at an early moment. Could they have rescued mm -hmm. them even earlier? Probably. Uh, and, and convincing them of that is actually quite difficult. Now, you mentioned earlier that you're a pediatric uh, plumber, <laughs> <laughs> and, and obviously there's a lot of procedures where uh, you're dealing with uh, uh, pediatric uh, patients. Um, they may find the procedure uncomfortable or um, an are anxious about the procedures, which seem to be um, or perceived by patients and, and their families as, as something routine and, and not having any uh, possible adverse uh, events. Um, why should we not just consider it a, a minor surgery and, and uh, not be concerned? Well, I think it's pretty clear that there are risks involved in administering I'm always very clear with my patients that those are the risks I'm most concerned because, frankly, from a uh, frequency standpoint, they are more likely to encounter uh, some issue related to respiratory compromise and mm -hmm. also the, the stress on the body that can cause uh, them the experience of a complication. Um, so I certainly want the patients to understand that there are uh, risks involved with sedating a child. A child is often not interested in having the procedure done. So we are mm -hmm. certainly looking to achieve control over them from a um, willingness to undergo the procedure perspective mm -hmm. quickly, and we wind up using bigger doses than people expect. Uh, children actually metabolize some of these medications a lot faster, uh, so we have to be um, prepared that we may need to, to give them more sedatives than, than we would expect. We're always uh, having to walk that fine line of giving enough sedative to, to, to help the child to go through the procedure safely, but not so much sedative that we now create new complications. So, so why do you think it's uh, difficult to predict how a particular patient will react uh, to, to when they receive an opioid? Um, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I've been looking a lot at various uh, sedatives recently over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, because the FDA and the NIH and some scientists have really drawn our attention to the fact that we sedatives are doing things I don't think we even realized they were doing. So there, there actually may be neurotoxicity involved with using a lot of sedatives. Um, with opioids in particular, my own theory is, you know, I used to say people are wired differently. Now I, I really realize that's more about the fact that um, everybody has a different number of opioid receptors. They may be genetically programmed to upregulate or downregulate those receptors in different ways, uh, and their sensitivity to opioid uh, may really be determined in, in some genetic way that we don't fully understand or even congenital way. So something about them dictates how, how the opioids are going to work. And since we don't really know exactly how opioids work to begin with, it's really extraordinary that we are still able to use them on a regular basis to get what we want, which is the patient to be cooperative during the procedure. But <laughs> Yeah, and then it sounds like it's exacerbated uh, by the fact that uh, you're dealing with children yes, yes. versus an adult, uh, where I guess most dosages for opioids and sedatives are based on adults and need to be adjusted to the, uh, to the pediatric patient on hand. Exactly, exactly. We definitely have to be prepared to do weight-based dosing, but again, to titrate to effect. So, Which puts a premium then on, on making sure that the anesthesia provider uh, 
uh, really can recognize the onset of respiratory compromise and, and can then intervene as quickly and as early as possible uh, during the procedure. Yes. Is continuous patient monitoring like the last resort? I often think of it as the canary in the mine shaft used as an indicator of methane and carbon monoxide. Uh, should all patients receiving sedation be monitored or just those that are undergoing moderate to deep sedation? So I think an unequivocal yes, all patients receiving sedation should be monitored, and all medical guidelines at this point are pretty clear that that is the case. So uh, there really are almost no levels of sedation, certainly in pediatrics, where uh, you shouldn't monitor a patient. Um, I worry that this guideline is not as easily um, recognized as applicable uh, in some private office situations, and some of those go beyond medicine. So in particular, we do worry about sedation in dentist office, and it's really important that patients be uh, thinking about their child receiving sedation in a dentist office. At the very least, they themselves should be the continuous uh, monitor of that, of that child, even, again, if it's very light sedation. These are the types of situations out way beyond um, the, the, the walls of, of a hospital or even an ambulatory surgical center. It's really in a, in a very small office where people may be getting uh, sedation without that continuous monitoring. Uh, You're absolutely right. We've, we've dealt with uh, a number of children who have died just having their, their teeth extracted or undergoing what would normally be considered sort of routine dental procedure. And just because they're children, they probably were given more sedatives than an adult, and um, because the dentist was providing it and also doing the procedure at the same time, there wasn't a, a second uh, pair of eyes on the uh, child to make sure that he or she was safe. Yes, and, yeah. and again, you know, I want to believe that all dentists are, are doing their best and practicing safe sedation, but what is interesting is it's a different licensing board, it's, a, it's mm -hmm. different guidelines, and so it's been harder to understand exactly what guidelines they're following. But Yeah, absolutely. So, so it's really, that, again, that combination of are you using the right technology and do you have enough uh, personnel on hand to make sure that uh, patients are safe and, and leave the facility, or in this case, the dentist's office, uh, safely? Yeah, any last words of advice you would give to clinicians or hospital executives wanting to improve opioid safety in their facility? The words of advice I guess I would give are around being open to these new technologies, capnography included, which may provide you with early warning. I'm a firm believer in the old aviation uh, safety analogy for medicine. If you're flying an airplane, most of the time you, you, you get on at your point of departure and you land at your point of arrival and, and there was no problem, but you would be open, I think all of us would be open to a new dial, a new technology in the cockpit that would help us to recognize that trouble is coming and to see that way before the trouble actually happens and give us a chance to avoid it. And uh, I would really encourage all clinicians and hospital executives to be open to the fact that we in medicine have that possibility, too, that these new technologies are here and more are coming, and we should be open uh, to exploring them and certainly to incorporating them in our guidelines when they've been proven to be helpful. That's great recommendations and advice. So, so thank you so much for joining me on this podcast, and hopefully clinicians and hospital executives out there will listen to this and, and implement capnography in their own facilities or uh, other patient monitoring devices that may yet to be, uh, to be produced and, and, and sold in the market. So thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. Pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. This clinical education podcast is made possible by an unrestricted grant from Medtronic.